What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, Baby Einstein, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, consultants, create additional revenue streams, stop just trading time for dollars. Uh, they hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Uh, Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Definitely check out. We have a download, which is a free dream product ladder, so you can plan your business on one page. All right. Today, I'm very excited. This episode was inspired by Shira Rubin, who is founder of Soul Flight Yoga, who her and her husband are good friends, and she is a raving fan of today's company and products. And so I had to check them out and uh, they are amazing. So I understand why she is a raving fan. And today we have the founder of the Yes Bar, Abigail Wald. And the Yes Bar was born in 2012 in her kitchen in California. And it wasn't some business idea. It was her younger son had a lot of food sensitivities and health challenges. And if anyone's a mom or a dad and you are saying no all the time, and especially with something they want to eat, it's a painful thing. And she wanted to create something that she could say yes to every time. And people can say yes, and she can say yes to the yes bar. And my favorite quote, Abigail, that you've said is, dude, life can suck sometimes, so let's get up and make it good. And the yes bar is making it good. So the Yes Bar, you can get it at yesbar.com, Amazon, and there are 200 stores right now and growing across the country. Abigail, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm excited. I love what you built. So thank, thank you. you for, uh, thank have- you. And I want to get into the really the inspiration behind this. But I have to just say some quick fun facts because they're kind of crazy. I like to get some fun facts. People get to know the person behind the company. And so Abigail has jumped out of a plane. She's gone dog sledding and she was on the David Letterman show. So if you want more of that, you'll just have to ask her personally. (laughs) But but it was inspired. And I remember watching the video. I was really touched by one of your sons. um, And I know there was many inspirations for the yes bar, but one of your sons um, had a, a vaccination. Yeah. And what happened? So, um, you know, uh, (laughs) it's kind of a really intense topic, as you know. Yeah, Um, Yeah. it's a very charged topic. It's a very charged topic. So let me just say... um, We'll uh, preface it. You're not anti-vaccine. I know that. I'm truly not. Um, What I am, though, is is pro-research, and I think that... um, you know, I, I have two sons. My first son actually was born with a congenital heart defect. Um, and we actually gave him extra vaccines. If you if you have a heart defect, you're actually lucky enough to get extra special vaccines. <laughs> Added so, bonus. Um, yeah, and we, we totally wanted them and gave them to him, and he did great with them. Um, and uh, my younger son, we also gave vaccines to. Um, and he did okay, although he had a few weird um, sort of reactions like swelling and things that all seemed totally normal for me at the time. Um, but his immune system, such as it is, uh, was actually not able to tolerate it. He, he wound up having an encephalitic reaction wow. um, to his 15-month-old DTAP. So, you know, um, I don't typically uh, share that with people because it's, it's very hard for them to hear, even though it's an acknowledged scientific Reality, it kicks people into the political discussion, of, um, you know, uh, of all that, that I personally don't, you know, I just know what happened to us. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah, my point is not to start a debate with people on uh, whoever's listening on vaccinations or anything, but it's just your story. And this is one of the things that kind of propelled you to look into 
health and other options. Because when I heard the story, for one, it's something if, if someone, I think if that's happening to someone in general, they're not like, oh, this is normal. They could be like, okay, like this is something's wrong here for one, you know, but on the other end, that's kind of one of the inspirations. Because when I heard the story, it really, it was scary because yeah. it's not like there was just some swelling or something else that happened at the time. It was, yeah. I think you said he just stopped talking or I'm not sure what. Yeah, he, um, there's a lot of things that happened, um, you know, classic encephalopathic reactions, um, photophobia, couldn't look at light, stopped talking, lost all his affect. I um, uh, had an encephalitic cry and scream for hours right after immediately. Scary. Like, within two minutes. Yeah. Um, so there were a lot of things that happened, but, um, you know, again, it, you know, it's, it's it always started been- you on this journey, you know, <laughs> of looking into health and what other options would, it would help him. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, what I was going to say is it's always interesting to me in that, like, you know, we can acknowledge that peanuts are fine, but for some people they'll kill them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So exactly. Um, I think it's just a, about a basic acknowledgement that, you know, maybe most people are okay, but for some people it's not okay. And for whatever reason for him, it really wasn't. Um, yeah. And the problem was because of the charged political nature of it um, and because they're really, we don't honestly understand the brain yet and we don't understand. So that it was very hard to have an open discourse about what actually was happening. Um, and so I, it was very hard for me to get help because actually there actually is no cure for encephalopathy. Yeah. Um, there, there is actually no cure for it. Um, time. And, uh, and so time was good. But as a mom of a kid going through any sort of health crisis, you know, it wasn't enough. You want to hit fast forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I really didn't have much available to me. He was 15 months old. And, you know, as I mentioned with my first son, like I could have heart surgery for him. Like it was, it was an acknowledged open conversation and there were clear medical pathways to get to another place. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, um, I really wound up having to say, okay, well, what, what can I do to help him? And, and somebody had first mentioned to us at the time, like, you know, maybe take him off all gluten and dairy uh, and, and a few other things. And I was like, hold on a second, didn't you just name all the foods that exist? Right, right. And uh, at the time, it was really quite terrifying because I thought... And plus, kids will eat mac and cheese. They'll eat uh, right. pizza. Right. Besides, Grilled. if they yeah. wanted to, right. that's another whole whole story about it. Or yeah, they see right. kids eating cupcakes or snacks or whatever. They don't want to be eating healthy all of foods. Gluten yeah. and dairy, like all of it. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, even though you know, I, I had thought we were healthy and we were um, relatively healthy people, and uh, you know, I was always a foodie. But for me, that meant you know, like French bread and an awesome camembert. You know? <laughs> and all of a sudden, here I was having to say. You know, at first I thought, well, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. And so, um, it sounds just, a little out there, you know, yeah, it you was know? totally nuts to me at the time. I mean, just nuts. I just thought that's crazy. My, I'm already dealing with a kid that's struggling. Like I'm already figuring out what just happened to our family. And, um, and, and like to do something like that seemed overwhelmingly difficult. But, uh, at the time really what happened was I felt like, um, uh, something happened where he, he was really just not getting better and it, it was just really scaring us and I I decided to try it for a few days and I tried it and the result was immediate and what did you try when you said try I, it what did you do I, I can't remember the exact at the moment but I'm sure what I did was pull I just probably pulled gluten and dairy I didn't pull anything else in those first few days and um and I remember uh you know, it was really just mind-bogglingly difficult for me at the time. I, I literally just couldn't even understand. Like, what do you eat? Yeah. I, I know that it sounds It was crazy. a video, I think, and I th- it was your husband's like, what should we feed him? And you're like, we have this jar of applesauce and it's only apples. And he's like, what else? You're like, that's all I got for you right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know? I really did. I, I, I really... Um, I went, well, that was slightly later. That was when I made the commitment to it. But yeah, mm-hmm. ultimately what I what happened was I first went off of it for a few days for him. And what I was immediate? To, what did you see that was immediate like when you did that? He could start to look at me. Mm. 
And again, this is anecdotal. I can't prove any of this scientifically. I'm just telling you as a mom, it was immediate. He could look at me and he could start to talk again. And he was like sort of more present. And, um, and I thought, well, this is nuts and this is impossible and this is difficult. We went to a couple parties and I was like, yeah, let him eat the chicken tenders, let him whatever. And immediately the gaze went away again and mm. he could talk. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I said to my husband, let's try this again. We did it again. And we went off and a few days later, he was like more present, still not like he was. 100%, yeah way but there was a definitive like you could see the needle move and then I went back off and again you could see the dip and that was the applesauce moment where I went nuts <laughs> went into our house. that's your, your book when you come out with your book on the story of uh, yes bar it's called the applesauce moment so yeah yeah that's the title okay. I, I went into the kitchen and I started taking everything out of the cabinets and my husband was like but this is healthy this is you know from Whole Foods this is Whole if it's Whole Foods it's healthy <laughs> like, I was like I don't care we don't eat this and I, I was determined that my son wouldn't have to go through this alone I thought God this is so hard this is so painful like he shouldn't do this alone we're all gonna do this we're gonna we're gonna stand by him like I'm not having us sit there and eating pizzas and be like sorry buddy tough luck here's your arugula salad you know and then on top of it I also had this feeling of like whoa like if that food is having that reaction in him it's not gonna be so obvious for me because I'm not compromised You're not as sensitive to it but it's still happening what? at another level yeah what's it doing like what how's that possible yeah. you know so I became kind of fascinated by that and started looking into it. And again, I think a lot of this, we just honestly don't totally understand that. I mean, do you um, think at this point, do they think it's like inflammation that's causing a reaction or what do you think? A lot of people believe that there's mm. gut inflammation and that that's tied to Like with the dairy and the gluten, he's extra sensitive to it. Yeah, like uh, you know, maybe he always was extra sensitive. Maybe he has a harder time processing toxins, which is why he couldn't process the vaccine. I, I don't know. I don't mm. think we understand yet enough. Um, you know, I remember talking to a, a neurologist at the time who was like, look, I wish I could give you an answer, but we understand like very little of how the brain works and I'm a neurologist. And so she was like, you got to do what you've got to do as a mom. And that was sort of the moment where I was like, okay, Nobody has an answer to this, and the only answer I have is food, and I'm going to just grab it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I did. I went into our house, and I, I ripped through everything, and I um, came down to the applesauce because that was what I had in the moment. And my husband said, I need to feed them, and I handed him the jar of applesauce, and I had just tears streaming down my face. I remember I was lying. I was literally sitting on the kitchen floor. Like, if you took a picture of me, I was sitting in the kitchen floor with – piles of food around me that I was now saying we were going to get rid of, right? Mm. Gonna donate and that we would not be eating anymore. And it was all good food. It just wasn't anything we could eat anymore. And um and my husband was looking at me like I was insane and I was clutching this applesauce jar like it was gonna save my life. And I and I just said to him like this is what we're doing. And then he came back to me two hours later and I just had more things on the floor. And he looked at me and I was like, handed him the applesauce. And he was like, you're going to have to figure something else out. And I said, give me a moment. <laughs> and, and I did. And what I found was um, I didn't enjoy substituting. What I enjoyed was um, real foods that were naturally free of gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and sugar. And so I just started thinking to myself, okay, stop thinking about what you normally eat and stop trying to figure out, you know, some gluten-free pizza. Like, like, cause I went through that phase, but then I was like, no, no, no. Like what's just like a protein, a vegetable and a fruit, you know? And then there were a few sort of pseudo grains that we could eat, you know, buckwheat. And, um, and I was like, okay, what, you know, what can I do here? Like how, how can I reinvent how I think about food? Um, and so we lived like that for a few years and, um, uh, we're very lucky in that my, my son did recover. Um, he, thank God, is great. Um, so talk about making the first bar. So I was, even during all this period, it was a little nuts because I made all of our own food. And I became, I, I will fully freely say I kind of went nuts. You know, I, I, I was like, 
um, that's really nice that you're handing me a glass of water, but where did this water come from and what was in it? You went where... to the extreme end of, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And it was like, I would buy nuts from a farmer that I knew and I would literally milk those nuts and then I would culture that milk and that would become our yogurt and I would buy fruit from a farmer I knew and I knew their processes and I would take that fruit and I would make jam out of it and, you know, no sugar and, and that was how we had yogurt and jam, you know, so it was pretty intense. And um, so I was making all of our own food and I was carrying coolers with us everywhere we went and it got really antisocial. Um, what I discovered is that other people had a huge problem with what we were and were not eating. <laughs> That was one of the surprising things was I was surprised. I was like, wait, this is our life. Like I, I wasn't, you know, imposing values on other people. Wasn't. Yeah. I just didn't yeah. want to do it for myself. Cause I felt like hey, we're in this process. We're in this healing protocol right now. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and I was fully committed to it cause I could see my son changing day by day. And, um, and there was just no question. You know what I mean? There was just no question. And so I, uh, you know, I live in Los Angeles. I'm sure if I had kids with asthma, I might not live here, right? If that was a sensitivity that we had, the air isn't clean. Like, you know, you do what you need to do where you have your sensitivities and you have to listen to your body. And, um, and so ultimately, uh, that was it. We, we went, um, we went everywhere and I felt really lonely. And, um, and then my son was feeling lonely at school. You know, he'd come home and he'd be like, they had cupcakes today. And, you know, I would lie with him on the floor and be like, what kind of cupcakes? And we could make those with almond flour. And he was like, I don't want your stupid almond flour cupcakes. <laughs> Traumatizing. And I just thought, well, gosh, how has this become so sad? Like, we're making this incredible like discovery about our bodies and about food and we're eating like the stuff we should be eating. Like, why are we sad that we're not eating like Domino's pizza? Like what? This doesn't make sense to me, you know? And, and I thought, well, I need to change all this up. Like I'm going to, I'm going to own this. And instead of feeling like what we can't eat, I want to focus on what we can and I want to celebrate and I need to make him a treat, something that he really loves. And my kids were just playing one day and I literally had this moment where I just looked at them and I was like, like nothing brilliant was happening. Like maybe he cried about a cupcake that day or maybe not. I don't really remember. But I just looked at him and I thought, I am going to go in the kitchen and I'm going to make something so darn tasty. And it's going to be all the things that we can eat. And it's going to be like amazing. And I don't even know what it is. And I just started pulling everything onto the counter. I literally had no idea what I was going to make. Like was it a cupcake? Was it a tart? Was it a omelet? I, like I didn't know what I was going to make. And I just took everything out that seemed yummy. <laughs> I took out the almonds and the macadamias and the pecans, and I took out the dried unsulfured apricots that I had, and the tart cherries, unsweetened cherries, and the cinnamon, and the you know actual vanilla bean pods, and and I took out the Celtic sea salt. And I, at that point, we were eating honey and you know organic honey and maple syrup, and and I took out my pure Vermont maple syrup and my honey. I'm getting hungry, yeah. I yeah. know, and, and dark chocolate that I had that was really a good soy-free dark chocolate. And, and I thought, well, golly, what do you make with all this, you know? And I just was like, I don't know. <laughs> I just kind of started doing things and putting it together and broke out a few kitchen equipment things and started mashing and pounding and changing and like a chemistry experiment. And I was like, it probably wants to get cooked. <laughs> I put it in the oven. I mean, I can't tell you how unscientific this was. <laughs> it looks like it wants to be cooked. I think I'm going to stick it in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> put it in the oven, and then I took it out, and I was like, oh, I guess I should cut it because it's big, and then I cut what, it. Was it in, like, a big tray, or what did you put it in? It was in a big sheet. Like, big I just sheet. did, like, just, like, bleh, you know? And I, and I took it out of the oven and then I started like breaking it apart and cutting it into pieces and I put like like 30 of them. It made like 30 of them or something and I put them on a plate and my kids had been doing something and I called them up and my husband was home and my husband's a cyclist. So he loves like power snacks. So he came in and I was like, hey guys, I made this thing for you. And I was like, went into the kitchen to clean up and I came back out and they were like gone. Mm. And I was like, oh, well that went over. <laughs> experiment worked like loved them 
And then my husband was like, make more of those. And I was like, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> I should have wrote down what I actually did. <laughs> so then I tried to like make it again and I was able to figure it out. I wrote it down right then and, um, and I figured it out and then I um, started bringing them with us to all these like birthday parties, you know, where we'd have like our lentil and our kale and <laughs> we our- Put those people in that corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're different. And, you know, what was fascinating was people would start coming up to us and they were like, what are you eating? And I was like, oh, you totally don't want this. Like, you should go get a slice of blue birthday cake. Like, this is, like, healthy. This is weird shit. Like, don't. Blue birthday cake. <laughs> I can totally picture that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they were like, no, no. What is it? And I would give them a bite. And then they'd be like, oh, do you have an extra one? And I was like, okay. And then they were like, can I, ha- will you make those for me? And I was like. Well, it's really labor intensive, but sure, you know, next time I make some, I'll, I'll bring you a couple. And people were like, no, no, I want my own. Like, I'll pay you. And I was like, no, you must be kidding me. And people started asking and begging to be able to pay me mm-hmm. for me to make these for them. And I was like, that's just weird. So what was the first batch you made that you, it was for actual money for people paying you? Uh, it was like for a friend. Just a friend? Just friends started asking to pay me if so I how was, do you decide what to charge them I didn't know I was like literally like I don't know what do you want like you know and like I think I just charged them like the cost of making it you know I wasn't trying to make money or anything but I just like I couldn't keep I mean it was really expensive like the ingredients of a yes bar are like gold it's expensive and it's it's labor intensive the labor oh goodness the labor on a yes bar so yeah so then we um We, I was just like, you know, people were paying me like, and I would have just done it, but like, it was like tens of people asking for like 20, 30 of them at a time. I just couldn't do it. So what did you, those first people, what did you end up charging? I think it was like 20 bucks for a 20 bucks. And you're like, (laughs) give me 20 bucks. I'll buy the ingredients. I'll bring them to you. Okay. Yeah. And like little brown bag transfers, you know? (laughs) Like drug deal. (laughs) Like drug deal, right? (laughs) You're nuts, man. (laughs) My 20 where's my 20 so um, yeah so that was it and then we um uh you know that was what happened and and then um i i actually walked into this amazing beautiful store called air one in los angeles that is super healthy uh just beautiful beautiful fancy store um that i often would buy there were a lot of things that i needed that Wait, were is that an outdoor or is it a grocery store is it's it a grocery a- store okay it's okay yeah, and I would go, I went into Erwan one day, and by then they all knew me, because I was always the one asking for like, I'd like the spirulina, but I'm not the one that's, <laughs> I was that crazy person for so many years. <laughs> and then I said, uh, I said, you know, um, I've got this weird thing that I made in my house, and people really like them, and honestly, like, part of the reason I made it is because I can't buy any of the bars here, like, I know they're all really good and healthy, but our bar is actually healthier and it's tastier and it doesn't taste like birdseed and it's not like a glorified candy bar. It's like, it's just really amazing. And I said, do you want to taste it? And I literally had it like, it was wrapped up in like an organic, like, you know, wax free, like parchment paper, you know, I'd be like, it was just ridiculous. Like I'm like a a joke of myself, like a greeting card. And I I like, you know, unwrap this thing and I'm like, do you want to taste it? And he tasted it and he was like, get that on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I said, what, no, really? He goes, get that on the shelf. And uh, it was the manager over there. And I said, I said, okay, uh, wouldn't I need to be like a company to do that? And he said, yeah. I said, how, how, do, I, how, do, I, how, do, I, how do I do that? Out. So I think just from the small bit you've known me, you can tell that's a really bad thing to say to me. <laughs> I'm like, Okay, gauntlet down. Here you go, and uh, I was like, "I will, sir. I will figure that out." And that was it. I was just off and running. And there were so many mistakes that I made, but so much that I learned. And I taught myself ultimately how to do Illustrator because I wanted to design my own packages over time. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. Thanks. And then I taught myself. Um, Everything you know, I'd learned about distribution and brokers and grocery and um, margins and how to run a business and uh, you know it was like going to business school on my own 
back, you know what I mean, over the course of this year. Um, it was pretty intense. So I want to talk about some of the challenges, but Abel, tell me about getting that first batch to market for Air One, because you have to do the design, you have to do the packaging, you have to get, I mean, you can't bring it in wax paper, right, and be like, put it on the shelves. So talk about that first batch bringing it to market. You know, I don't know what I was thinking, but for some reason, I like immediately got a co-packer, which is nuts, right? Why is um, that nuts? Well, because it's kind of a big deal, and when there was the cottage food law, so I technically could have done it. I had even applied for the cottage food law, and I was going to make them out of my house, and I was like, that's just nuts. Like, that's crazy. Like, more people are going to want these things, you know? And I just immediately kind of went to this co-packer, started working it out, figuring it out. I wanted it all to be done properly. And in the same way that I had, like, felt really careful about my own family, now I felt like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be feeding all these other people's families. Like, I need to do this right, you know? So, um, cause I, as you can imagine, did not take that lightly. So then I went and started researching all of that, which was a whole other thing. And, um, and our first packaging was like, we literally like handmade every one of these things. And I mean, I can't even tell you the labor we've managed to find ways to still have the same process and have it be slightly less labor intensive, of course, but, but it is the same exact process and each batch is still, we're still made in small batches and still a lot by hand and, um, you know, but at the time we were literally like putting each one in its own little individual thing and sealing it. And, and my husband, we were trying to figure out the packaging and um, I had tried to work with a designer who's actually a really super talented designer, but um, I just didn't know enough about how to be a great client, honestly, at that time I had to learn. Um, and I was too close to the product and I, I, you know, there was a lot of learning curve for me, um, in, in so many different facets of it. Um, but one thing I do love to do is I learn. So I'm okay failing and getting back up and trying. Um, and so I decided, well, I'm going to do my own design and we're going to get rubber stamps. We're going to stamp it all. And so like we were stamping thousands and tens of thousands, I mean, twenties of thousands of these things, hand stamping. And my husband was like, you know this isn't like a third grade project, right? And I was like, yeah, kind of, but I don't have a better answer right now. And it was so funny because it kind of became iconic for our packaging. Like it was really special and we were like one of the first like brown craft wrapper, you know, um, bars and, you know, it was like very special look and people could really tell it was like a handmade product, you know? Um, what were we the first flavors? that you, because I, I could see now you have, you have some really interesting flavors, and I want to hear how you came to them. You have mocha cayenne, macadamia chocolate, strawberry coconut, and black sesame sea salt. Really interesting. What were the first ones that you that they asked for? So uh, mocha, I mean, um, macadamia chocolate chip was the original one I had made for my kids, which is uh, macadamias and chocolate chip, sea salt, um, and uh, fruits, and it's also got these wonderful, beautiful dried fruits in it. So it's like tangy and rich and chewy and crunchy and yummy. And uh, and then I was like, well, let's make like a grown-up flavor too, because you know the bars aren't specifically for kids. You know, like I made it for my son, but they're really a grown-up bar. They're pretty sophisticated um, and really gourmet ingredients and all of that, really high end and. So I thought, well, let's make a, another, like, even more grown-up flavor. And, you know, I love, like, spicy coffee. So I was like, spicy coffee. <laughs> so mocha again, cayenne. We, yeah, and there's, there's um, yeah, mocha cayenne. And, and we were one of the first bars to actually do that. Now there's a number of coffee bars, but um, we were really one of the very first to do that. So uh, it was exciting to kind of watch the trend sweep. Um, and people really love those flavors and then later on we added the strawberry coconut and the black sesame sea salt so it's really is, based off like what do i like and yes. uh, it goes from there i just keep making things that i think are fascinating and i assume someone else will dig them you know what i mean like i figure like there's enough people who really care about food like our bars are for people who care about what you put in your body like you don't want to compromise you want something really great but you also want amazing taste like you're also a foodie you know you're not just willing to put stuff that's good for you in your body because it's functional but it doesn't taste good like you know i wanted somebody to feel like there's no place you have to compromise and that's kind of the meaning of the word yes like 
I didn't name the bars. You know, at some point when I realized it was like I was going to have to get them on the shelf, I was like, what's the bar's name? Like, it doesn't have a name, you know? And that's when the idea of the yes bar came because it's like the thing I can say yes to because it's good for you, but it also epitomizes that idea of yes, like the yes bar. Like, it takes this idea of all the no's that we have and it turns them into your yes because I think on like a spiritual Jungian journey, like, you know, it is your it is your failures that lead you to your success. It is your pain points that become your gift to the world. And so it really was about taking this thing that was our pain point and saying, okay, instead of like getting upset or whatever, we're going to turn this into this place where not only are we going to heal this for our family, but we're going to create something for other families that not everybody's going to have the craziness of mind that I had to like figure this out for their own family, let alone turn it into a business. Like that's just insane. I don't know why I did that. So, <laughs> well, it's interesting the challenge or the transition from you making it for your family to business. People are demanding it, but that the grocery they are one. What was the next step? Uh, a friend of mine in San Francisco was like, "There's a juice bar here that I think should carry your bars," and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> I called the woman and I was so nervous and uh, she was great. It was Thrive Juicer and she was so great and she brought us in um, and then our third store was Buy Right in San Francisco um, and Driver's Market in San Francisco and they were so lovely and amazing. I mean, just, uh, you know, I can't say enough great things. Um, uh, and, you know, Buy Right is just a, a phenomenal store in the food world. Um, for any of you who are up in the Bay Area, will we'll certainly know it. And, you know, Drivers is certainly no slouch either, right? Beautiful store. And, um, and so uh, we had just really wonderful partners. And as I started to build out, I realized, like, oh, this is like there's a tribe of people. I'm not alone. Like, I may have been sitting alone on the playground there, like, eating my lentils and kale, but there's, like, actually a whole tribe of people who really care about good food and really get it. And there's people wanting this, hungry for this, needing it to be easy. Not everybody can spend hours in the kitchen making up their own stuff. And, um, and I felt like it was like my civic duty to, to share this, that I had like solved a problem and like, wait, you know, Hey, here's a solution. Like, I want you to be happy too. you know, have a yes bar. Like, don't cry. Don't cry in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like I did. Like I did. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of evangelists for the S bar, and that's how I heard about it, right? And that's how it kind of spreads organically. Talk about um, there's a big difference between selling in stores and direct to consumer, wholesale versus direct to consumer. Talk about some of the advantages, disadvantages uh, of, of what you see with that. You know, look, stores are amazing in that they have their own followings and each store has their own personality. And certainly you've got a store like, you know, um, Byright doing a lot of great social justice as well work. And so, you know, um, there's something amazing about all of our stores, whether it's Shira's yoga studio or, you know, these are people out there connecting with their community, creating tribe hubs, so to speak. Um, and so there's something very special about that. Um, that said, the retail market is not that supportive of young startup, especially high-end, true-value businesses. Um, you know, when you sell to a store, the reality is that we also now are in the business of supporting that store. And um, our product is so high-end, so labor-intensive that, um, you know... Uh, the margins, it's not like cheap, cheap ingredients. Yeah, you're not selling cotton candy for $3 that cost you two cents, you know? Um, and so we are, I don't actually know how much it takes to make cotton candy, but you know what Sound I mean? Sound about right, yeah. I yeah. assume the sugar is probably two cents. I, you know, the dye is probably a little bit more, and then the packaging, and, and the trucking, you know, you got to give them something. But, but um, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, I, it, it just... One of the things that we love about direct-to-consumer, which is why we're now putting more of our efforts there, we certainly love the stores that we have and we love being able to connect with stores that we can, um, but direct-to-consumer is our passion right now because A, it allows us to grow, it's more sustainable, and it's more direct. It's more yeah. honest. Like People can come to us and be like, what were you thinking when you made strawberry coconut? And I can be like, okay, this is what I was thinking. You know, It really allows us to connect um, with our you get track. feedback. Yeah, 
and and to be serving people and part of what this whole business is like we are in the service industry like sorry we are in the service industry quite literally you know like we are serving people food and we are serving people joy and we are serving them a way to make their lives easier and we take that really really seriously so um, we like to spread joy whether it's a little email that's like hey how'd you like your yes bar like we always say between me Jeremy and Brennan because you know Jeremy and Brennan now are running um, the company along with me and um, they're incredible guys we should definitely talk about them um, and and you know they are um, we always talk about this idea that our goal is to leave every day better than we found it you know leave every encounter better than we found it leave like Put a little yes in everybody's life. Open their horizons. You know, make something possible that wasn't possible before. Yeah, we'll talk about that. When did the the partners come in to the picture? So I ran the company um, on my own with my husband's help, uh, often helping me at four in the morning, uh, doing all sorts of crazy things that you do when you're running a company, um, and. Uh, you know, uh, with two young children, and it was really challenging. And I did that for three years on my own. And then I realized this company wants to grow well beyond what I can make it. Like I had large retailers coming to me wanting to put me in regions of the country, and I had to say no because I didn't have the workforce to sustain it. Um, and uh, I was told by several people in the industry, like, don't do that until you can really know, like, what you're getting into and be able to really sustain that retail world. And I knew that I couldn't uh, at that time. Um, and But I also knew more people deserved to have yes bars, and I knew that um, more people wanted them. Uh, and they were they were just growing. Like, it's always been – it's never been in yes bar, um, you know, ever a situation where it's like, oh, uh you know, um, how are we going to drum up business? It's always been, oh my God, how are we going to manage? Like, which one are we going to say yes to now? Which opportunity are we going to say yes to? Because people have always said yes to the yes bar, which is very exciting. Um, and so... Lesson is just name your product something with yes in it, so they just, no. You know, look, every once in a while, it won't be somebody's cup of tea, but it's just the overwhelming majority of our experiences are just phenomenally positive. Um, I, I mean, how can you go wrong? You've got amazing, delicious ingredients, like put together in a beautiful way, in a very conscious, loving way, in like an eco-friendly box. I mean, like, like what's wrong with it? Do you know what I mean? Like, what are you going to say no to? You know? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> like, so, um, so yeah, so we, uh, so the partners you're saying, the what happened was, as we grew, I realized that um, it was like, it, I liken it to like having a child who's like an incredible softball player, and like you're just kind of not really a softball player. So you go with them for a few years to Little League, and then you're like, okay, dude's got an arm. Like, like I need to like talk to somebody who actually coaches this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Because like, I'm not going to take him where he needs to go. It's kind of that kind of feeling where I felt like, Yes Bar needs to grow, it needs to grow big, and it needs people who aren't sitting there also taking care of their babies all day long, you know, like people who can just full on embrace this and run with it. Um, because at the end of the day, like my passion was about family and healthy eating, and I wasn't actually able to sustain my family with healthy eating because I was trying to feed everyone else all the time. And so I realized like, A, I'd gotten off my values, which doesn't make me a, a good spokesperson, do you know what I mean? I need to live my truth. Um, and also, I need to um, let this fly as high as it wants to fly. So I start, spent a year deciding I'm looking for partners. And I almost partnered three times with three different people. Um, and each time it wasn't quite right. What was no, it? Ever. Um, different, um, you know, maybe a different vision for the company, uh, different, you know, um, uh, I just didn't. I mean, you're like dating for marriage, right? So I'm, I'm curious of what you were looking for and what you saw that didn't resonate. I wanted passion. I wanted people who this was going to be their everything. And I wanted people who got the ethos of the company too, who were going to care about their customers the way I care. I wanted people who it wasn't just going to be a business opportunity. It was, it was a way of life. And 
Um, ultimately, um, I found uh, Jeremy and Brennan, who are just phenomenal partners. And I How did you find them? Uh, you know, they had come to me years before. They both have a tremendous amount of experience in the food world. Um, uh, Brennan went to Cornell uh, for the hotel management program. Um, uh, so he's a hotelier. And then um, he also worked a little bit on the finance side and then helped a few other companies. And, um, you know, he had worked with a friend in a baby food company. All, all, had a lot of experience in all in super healthy um, foods. And he himself is celiac. So, you know, he doesn't take gluten free lightly. Um, and he understands living a, a specific life, you know, and, and the values of it. And he's also an incredible chef, just a phenomenal chef. So um, he's also got a huge love of food. And then I've got Jeremy, who is just also so passionate and so heartfelt and such a such a good, good soul, you know, and, and both of them are just such hardworking people. And Jeremy has, comes with years of experience from Brad's, from Honest, from, you know, um, lots of different wonderful companies that he's worked with and been able to see really big companies and where they've failed and where they've succeeded and where they've, you know, certainly not failed, but, you know, made choices that maybe he wouldn't have made if it were his company. And so he's been able to learn all around. Um, and has a tremendous amount of experience in the retail world and um, they are also best friends and together they had come to me they had been working for a company a distribution company uh, at the time called Green Shoots in Los Angeles and um, they had come to me at, with uh, they were working on a deal for Safeway um, at the time that ultimately like never happened um, exactly uh, as planned um, and I would not have been able to handle at the time. I was too small. Um, but they had come to me about that. And that's how we had met is they were really interested in the bar. And so then a year later, I wound up sort of connecting with them randomly. And then I was like, Hey, you guys. And, you know, they looked at everything in the company. And they were like, Yeah, this is crazy. Let's do this. And they just jumped in and um, really have fully embraced it. And it's their full time job. And they're just the most wonderful partners I could ever ask for. So what are their roles? What do they do? So Brennan is actually now um, the CEO. And uh, and he really, I mean, they both really um, run everything. Uh, so it's kind of like they're arbitrary assignments, do you know? But um, to some extent, like really like they own the company and run it with me. And um Brennan is really great with um, large scale, high end biz dev. So he's really good with business development and, you know, connecting with people. He's just a connector. That's what, you know, he's, it's one of his amazing skills. Um, and again, he's an incredible chef. And so is Jeremy, also an incredible chef. Um, so together in the kitchen, I mean, the three of us, it's just couldn't be more fun. Um, so in terms of developing new products and developing line extensions, and um, there's just so much more to come. Uh, and then in terms of, um, uh, what else in terms of, um, you know, uh, Jeremy's amazing with operations, but also in terms of relationships, uh, and they just, they do all the heavy lifting. I mean, they're, they're doing everything, you know, we're a small company, so we all wear all the hats and especially them these days, you know, and I'm still the vision and the heart and sort of brand staying on brand and um you know helping so Abigail, what i want to hear um some of the challenges along the way some of the things that you were you've experienced and then on the flip side i want to hear some of the the milestones you're proud of but start with some of the the challenges you laugh because there's probably a number of them that Really, are so many I can't even tell you. Uh, the, the 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 failures are numerous, right? And that's okay. Like, um, I'm proud of those failures. You know, they were moments of um, trying to make flavors that didn't work, or trying to figure out how the heck could we, you know, make more of these than ten at a time. You know? What flavors didn't work? That looking back is crazy that you tried it. Oh, I really wanted to use some citrus. Um, fresh citrus and it just makes the nuts soggy um, uh, you know they're very temperamental little creatures you have a few around I don't know if you could show a few what you have a few so 
Um, so here's like macadamia. This is the original macadamia chocolate chip, and this is a mocha cayenne, and here's a black sesame, and here's strawberry coconut. And um, you can kind of see what they look like inside. Um, so this is what a yes bar looks like inside. And we look like um, a cookie because we kind of taste like a cookie, but we've got, you know, all the functionality of a super healthy snack bar. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, then the packaging. I mean, you know, listen, I, I haven't done anything n normally. Like if you set out to create a company, you wouldn't put – 14 to 22 ingredients in a bar. You'd be like, that's insane. It's not sustainable. But I wanted to have this taste explosion. I wanted to have it be, and I wasn't willing to sacrifice. And I can't tell you how many times, like literally so many people were like, you can't keep using real macadamias. Like, you know that. Or you can't keep using, you know, real vanilla. You can't keep using, you know, why don't you just switch to a different salt? You know, and I was like, because the mineral content in this salt is this. And the flavor of this particular salt is this. And, you know, um, we just never surrendered. And so it was always like, it, you know, really what it looked like was we would have an idea and it would, or me, because that was for the first few years, I would have an idea and it would be no, no, not possible. No, nobody does it that way. Nobody does the packaging that way. Nobody makes them round. Nobody does this. Nobody does that. And I was like, so how are we going to do it? <laughs> and the answer was, we're not, you're not, you're going to do what everybody else does. And I was like, no, I'm not. So how am I going to do it? <laughs> That's just what it looked like. And it was about like being crazy and believing in myself and believing in these bars really and and believing in people that they deserve this. I mean, that was really wasn't even believing in myself. It was like, I believe that someone should be able to open this up and have it feel like a cookie and eat it and enjoy it. And like I can't tell you, I know that sounds crazy, but like that was like my burning desire. So there were so many failures along the way, like this kind of packaging doesn't work and you've got to use the other kind of packaging. Well, I get that, but you know, it's not as good for the environment and it's not, you know, um, it's not as pretty. And I wanted everything to be visually beautiful as well. I wanted, I wanted the whole experience from the beginning to end, from the tactile feeling you get touching the bar to the, to the wrapper, to the look of it, to the kind of ink that we use, you know? Like, I wanted everything to be a positive yes experience. And I, all along the way, we were talked out of that. And all along the way, I said no. I said no, this is the yes bar. So, um, yeah, so there were many failures on that path. Does that make sense? Many. Many. You know? Going against the norm, yeah. I guess. Failed equipment trials, failed flavors, failed co-packing situations, failed, um, you know, at one point we bought like 60 trays of this particular thing that I thought were going to help. And it was like, okay, who wants 60 trays? <laughs> you, know? Like, you know, I mean, just uh, there were so many different um, failures, so many. So on the flip side, Abigail, the um, milest business milestones you're especially proud of. After pushing through all those I'm challenges, packaging that we're in, I I'm proud of our boxes that are um, from sustainable forests. I'm proud of our ink. I'm proud of our ingredients. I'm proud that um, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> I'm proud that you know when somebody's eating a yes bar, it's like they're in my kitchen, and I'm giving them something that I give my own family. Um, I'm proud of my partners. I'm proud of my partners and everything they've laid down for this business. I'm proud of uh, the fact that we treat people kindly. I'm proud of uh, that we've got new ideas in the pipeline. I'm proud of the creativity of my partners. I'm proud of the places that have said yes to us, that have allowed us to thrive because we could not have done this alone. Um, so I'm proud of the companies that gave me a chance when I was a mom like who made this you know, originally as a snack for my kid, like, and they said, okay, yeah, you can sit on the shelf right next to these big companies. Like, I'm proud of those relationships. I'm proud of everybody who's given us a chance. Thank you, Abigail, for this. Anyway, I really appreciate you telling your story, and this is very inspiring. I want to point, I have one last question, but I want to point people towards where they can find out more, and one is yesbar.com. Any other places we should point people towards? So um, wherever you are that Amazon can get to you, um, you can certainly buy our bars on Amazon. 
um, and uh, yesbar.com. And, um, you know, we're in about 200 stores. You can take a look and see if we're in a store near you. Um, you can ask a store to carry us. Um, but you can always reach us directly at hello at the yesbar.com. And that one's at hello at the yesbar.com. Um, and uh, our website is yesbar.com or the yesbar.com. Either way, you'll get to us. Everyone should check out yesbar.com. Last question. I so want to ask about David Letterman, but I'm going to hold back. <laughs> I've been curious this whole time. But um, really, what's next for the next for the yes bar? So, so uh, well, first I'll answer your first question. David Letterman, I was on there as a skit, married off to one of the like postal workers that worked in his building or something like that. And they, like, as some skit, married me off to him. And then we uh, were supposed to jump off in a plane because I guess they'd found out I had jumped out of a plane. I, I don't really remember. I was, like, 20. Um, so some friend was like, do this. And I was like, sure, David Letterman's funny. So um, that was that. So can we find this episode somewhere? Is it, like... Oh, like... if you do, let me know. <laughs> I so I want to put a video of this at the bottom of this podcast. I do not know where it is and I do not have it. Um, I literally like went through and like just dumped out all sorts of things from my past one day thinking I'll never need them. And now I kind of wish I had them. But that was one of the tapes that I remember like, oh, I'll never look at that again. Yeah. Um, so, no, I don't have it. Uh, but um, what else? OK, so what's next for us? Um, definitely some new flavors in the works. Um, and we also, um, might do some sort of line extensions as well. Like how we think about the bar, like different functions for the bar. Um, what would be an example? I can't tell you or I'd have to eat I you. knew, I knew I'd have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they'll be coming soon. They'll be coming soon. And then, um, you know, we're also going to branch out beyond bars as to, to, uh, is the vision, you know, we want to, um, you know, this, this world of yes to eating, it's like, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of room in a lot of places, um, especially for some really talented staff partners. There we go. Thank you. Most important part of this whole thing is that your son is doing better and your, it sounds like that's, that's great. And that's kind of what started all of this. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And everyone should check out yesbar.com and support the vision and the, the quest and the journey uh, of health and say yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for everything that you're doing. I think information um, is key. And I think people getting information and feeling empowered to use information and try your own things and do your own science experiments with your family and your body, um, it's really important. And I think we give too much power to other people and really, we have a lot of power to heal ourselves, too. Not always. I'm certainly not going to be doing heart surgery on my older son. But there's plenty of room for us to be healing ourselves as well in tandem. Amen. Yeah, thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.